All right, it's my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Anderson, instructor at Lewis Clark State College, and she's giving a talk called Feminism is Not a Bad Word, Using Image Analysis to Teach Gender Equality. Great. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I want to start out by having you just take a moment and um, think about the word feminism and how you personally define it. I teach a lot of composition at um, Lewis Clark State College um, and a lot of freshmen. And a lot of times when students um, think about the word feminism um, or we talk about feminist text, they, they kind of get a, I don't want to say a snarl, but kind of, kind of a snarl on their faces. And it's like, that's a bad word. That's something we shouldn't be saying. And um, these are some of the common misconceptions that I've heard over the years from my students. Um, feminists hate men. They're angry. They're unfeminine. They're all bra burners. They hate sex. Feminism excludes men completely, and feminists don't believe in marriage. Again, there are lots of other misconceptions, but these are just some that I've called from the years. And I've often wondered where these misconceptions come from. In January, um, actually, of this year, anthropologist Michael Oman Reagan pointed out how sexism is culturally ingrained in our language. He looked at the Oxford English Dictionary, which is a description, uh, excuse me, descriptive dictionary of our language, and which is often the default for a lot of Apple products like Macs, iPads, iPhones. And he observed that some of the OED's um, examples are sexist. For example, rabid. The um, example was rabid feminist. For shrill, the rising shrill of women's voices. Nagging was nagging wife. Promiscuous, she's a wild, promiscuous, good time girl. And housework, she still does all the housework. And so we have that um, sexism is culturally ingrained. So this may be where some of that um, misconception comes from. And also, um, sexism is culturally embedded in the images we see. Um, primarily in advertising. And for decades, in fact, um, since 1969, Jean Kilborn has publicly spoken about how sexism is culturally embedded in the images we see. And that's primarily what I want to talk about um, today. So to um, focus on sexism in advertising, we need to um, make the case for the um, effect that ads have on us, and it's important to acknowledge that on average, we see about 5,000 or are exposed to, I should say, 5,000 ads um, every day. So um, we can see how this can affect us. I want to look at some vintage sexist ads first. The harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. And this is for pet pills from Kellogg's. <clears throat> Here we see a stereotypical image of the woman in the kitchen. The chef, which is referring to the Kenwood mixer here, does everything but cook. That's what wives are for. Don't worry, darling, you didn't burn the beer. This is for Schlitz beer. Successful marriages start in the kitchen, and this is an ad for Pyrex. And I don't know if you can see the small print here. It says, now the new mistress of the house can go right ahead with some of those girlhood dreams, right? Planning lovely meals for her man. You mean a woman can open it? And it's referring to the bottle of ketchup. Here, in this 7-Up ad, we see that um, the woman is now out of the kitchen. It looks as if she and her date are dining at a lunch counter. But note what they're eating. The man is eating not one, but two hamburgers. Huge plate of beans, chips, massive slab of apple pie, the all-American meal, right? And what's the woman eating? A lettuce and tomato 
sandwich, and her dessert looks like a pickle. <laughs> so this is, of course, promoting the stereotypical image that it's unfeminine to eat. A woman must watch her weight and remain trim. Violence is also depicted in these vintage or these old ads. This one, an ad for legs, men, pants. It's nice to have a girl around the house. And the girl is the, the rug that he's stepping on. This one is an ad for Chase and Sanborn coffee. It's not only condoning domestic violence, but the husband is bending his wife over his knee as if she's a child. This ad for broomsticks, men's pants, is suggested of gang rape, as all these closed men are tugging on a woman who is only in her undergarments. Now, um, if you look, I don't know that you can see the copy at the bottom, but it says, um, ring around the Rosie or Carol or Eleanor, etc. fun, but you can only play if you wear broomsticks slacks. This one always um, just, I don't know, it just kind of floors me, this ad. This, um, which one of these men do you think would be best at right? Now this is an ad for lawyers. Um, in a directory, um, but in the small print reads, we get that one of them is better at bankruptcy, one at property, and one at crime. You can't just tell by looking at them, but we see this larger message, which is extremely disturbing. So we go from violence, domestic violence, to rape, to murder. Is it always illegal to kill a woman? And this is for the um, Pitney Bowes postage meter. So now, I want to take a moment and switch to looking at contemporary sexist ads and um, how these messages aren't all that different from the vintage ones that we just looked at. Here's one in the kitchen. This is for GE appliances. We see the appliances in the background. The, um, the tagline there says, intelligence marries beauty. And clearly, the man is the intelligent one, as he is stereotypically holding onto his notebook, and he's wearing glasses. The woman here um, is the stereotypical ornamental woman. She's wearing a sequin dress, heels, and carrying her little accessory dog. So um, we get intelli intelligence marries beauty, more stereotypes against gender. When we compare these two ads, the Kenwood Chef one to the um, new contemporary one, we see that the messages may have changed a little bit. Um, wives are for cooking. Wives need to be stereotypical, be stereotypically beautiful. Yet all of both of them still have the sense of gender inequality. Women are somehow less than men. Cooking. This is for Bed Bath and Beyond. Here it looks as if the woman must alone balance all of these things to have a successful holiday meal. We get this when you need a hand with holiday entertaining. She's got um, mixers, the platter, choppers, all sorts of things. And she weirdly has like six hands coming out of her. So when we compare this, um, to the older one, we see that the bottle of ketchup somehow gave women a so-called sense of empowerment when she could open the ketchup. And now this new sort of empowerment seems to suggest that a successful woman must do all of these things herself and strangely um, with those six arms. So again, there's this idea of imbalance or inequality. Here's another one. This is for Wonder Bra, but note the text written across her breasts. I can't cook, who cares? So we take this idea of cooking, stereotypical idea of cooking, women's in the kitchen cooking. Now women don't need to cook, but they still have to be sex um, objects and look a certain way for their husband. Still a sexist message. 
eating. This is for Burger King. It'll blow your mind away. The BK Super 7 Incher. So we see that the message for women eating in advertising has somewhat changed. Women can now eat in ads, apparently. Here, the woman had to eat a um, lettuce and tomato sandwich. Here, she can eat the burger. Yet, eating the burger has turned into a sexual act, which is definitely not normal, and it's really weird. <laughs> Violence in contemporary ads also still exists. This is a Calvin Klein ad that depicts gang rape. We see that the man here on the right is pulling her hair. Her head is across his knee. This man is leaning over her as if he's about to rape her. Both of these men have their um, pants undone. This one in the corner here has a cigarette. The implication is he's already finished with her. When we compare these two ads side by side, we don't see a lot of change. Dolce & Gabbana, another ad suggestive of gang rape. Notice um, the submissive pose of the woman. Notice the expression on their faces. Compared to which one of these men do you think would be best at rape, we kind of get the answer in this contemporary ad. Domestic violence is still present in contemporary ads. This is for Fluid, it's a hair salon. And the tagline is, look good in all you do. And here we see the woman has a black eye. The man is behind her um, holding a necklace. And so we get the idea that um, maybe he's going to get her the necklace because he maybe feels bad for hitting her. And through all of this, though, her hair still looks good, is the message that's conveyed, which is really disturbing. Again, domestic violence, domestic violence, just in a different way. This even goes to murder in contemporary ads. This is for Duncan Quinn suits, or menswear, I should say. Here we see the woman is lying over the hood of a car. She appears either dead or unconscious. He has taken his necktie and has used it to strangle her. Is it always illegal to kill a woman here? Well, apparently, maybe so, but it's still condoned, at least in advertising. And now it's even more sexualized. We see this idea of murder, right? In her famous article, Sex Lies in Advertising, Gloria Steinem presented a good question. Suppose archaeologists of the future dug up women's magazines and used them to judge American women. What would they think of us, and what can we do about it? If we were to substitute women's magazines with advertising, those phrases, the message is still exactly the same as it was then. So what can we do about this? I think two main things. Recognize that feminism simply means that women want to be treated equal to men in our language and also in the images we see and, in, and are inundated with on a daily basis. And then also speak up about the prevalence of spex sexism in our language and the imagery that surrounds us. For example, I think we need to question ads like this one and wonder if this is truly indicative of change. This is a 2014 ad for Dear Kate Underwear. This is called their Ada collection, and it's named for Ada Lovelace, the woman who created the world's first algorithm. The women in this ad are powerful female um, tech executives, and when this ad first came out, it was celebrated because it was showing different body types. Usually, as you see in these ads I've shown you, we see one consistent body type over and over again. So we have different body types. We also have diversity. Um, and also, people were celebrating it because it shows women in the tech industry. 
This is another sample of their campaign. But we have to question this. Would we ever see Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, or Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, in their underwear? Or wearing a t-shirt that says, do I look cute while coding? We need to question why this ad shows women in their panties. Why can't it show them clothed and simply say, these women wear this particular brand of underwear? Indeed, a lot of people had the same questions. And they tweeted them, which then started a conversation about this ad campaign and gender equality. Um, just to show you a few, Silicon Valley, because you can't be an empowered woman in tech unless you take off your clothes. Here's a surefire way to help ensure gender equality in tech is taken seriously. Oh, no, really, this is the opposite of how we should fight sexism. Which then prompted the um, articles that questioned these images in this particular ad campaign. These tech stars say posing in their undie empowers women in tech, but critics assert they only perpetuate rampant sexism in Silicon Valley. Posing in your underwear undermines the message that you aim to be taken seriously as a technologist. So you see, our campaign went from people celebrating it to then questioning it and having a conversation. And that's important, that we just don't accept these things as actual change. I want to now go back to the Oxford English Dictionary, which I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation and the sexism that is embedded in our language. This is Michael Oman Reagan's um, original tweet to the OED. He says, hey, Oxford words, why is rabid feminist the usage example of rabid in your dictionary? Maybe change that? And he was just starting a, um, a conversation. This was Oxford um, Dictionary's flippant response. If only there were a word to describe how strongly you felt about feminism. This response and the fact that these um, sexual, um, sexist terms were used in the dictionary started this massive conversation, which was picked up by the AP and went everywhere. Um, here are some of the in initial tweets, um, people joining this conversation. Surely, your response to valid criticism of sexist definitions isn't a dismissive tweet implying Omen Reagan is, a rabid, is rabid about feminism. A couple of more. Indeed, would be so easy to say, thanks for drawing this to our attention. We'll look into it. I have two words, subscription canceled. This conversation and everything that happened afterward um, resulted in an apology from the OED. We were flippant in some of our tweets yesterday, sorry. And it also um, resulted in a change in their dictionary. Rabid fan has now the highest frequency in the Oxford corpus and rabid supporter also frequent. So they took out rabid feminist and replaced it with something more um, gender neutral. So hopefully then um, we can recognize what feminism really is. It's about equality for men and women and how publicly speaking up about it, um, acknowledging that those images we see day to day to day may be somewhat problematic. Um, and, and don't just let it go, talk about it. Um, even amongst ourselves in classrooms, with our friends, with our family, it can um, cultivate some sort of change. Thank you.